our speaker today is Dr. Albert Remus R. Rosana, Science and Technology Fellow of the Tuklas Lunas or Drug Discovery and Development Program of the Philippine Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, otherwise known as DOST PCHRD. And uh, a few months ago, Dr. Rosana earned his PhD in chemistry from the University of Alberta in Canada. He also obtained his MS in microbiology and biotechnology from the same university in 2013. Dr. Rosana graduated um, magna cum laude from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, BS Biology in 2005. As a graduate student at the University of Alberta, Dr. Rosana received several scholarships and prizes for his excellence in academics and research. Among those he recently received are the Dorothy J. Killam uh, Memorial Graduate Prize and the Isaac Walton Killam uh, Memorial Scholarship. He is currently working on the genetic engineering of sex pheromone pathways in the white muscardine mold for the targeted biocontrol of the mountain pine beetle, uh, which is, which is um, an epidemic right now in Western Canada. And um, another thing is uh, genomics and, metabol genomics and meta metabolomics coupled natural product discovery of uh, novel antibiotics against multi-drug resistant infectious diseases. And as a fellow in the DOST PHCHRD program, Dr. Rosana is uh, currently working with scientists and colleagues from the Visayas State University, Cavite State University, Mindanao State University, the National Academy of Science and Technology, and of course, UPLB on various research projects. So everyone, let us all welcome Dr. Albert Remus Rosana. Sir Albert. So good afternoon, Sir Cruz. Uh, thank you very much for that rather long and uh, excellent introduction of myself. That, that's really humbling. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm happy to be back here in the Philippines and hopefully share what I've learned overseas for the past 15 years. Um, let me just quickly share my screen and we can start. The screen is now shared, you can see it, and I'm clear, and you can see me as well. Yes, it's clear. We can see your uh, presentation, and your audio and video is clear also. Sounds good. So a pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Um, in today's webinar, uh, I'll be presenting, uh, I guess, uh, 11 years worth of work uh, where that culminated uh, last December, um, which is on an amalgamation of different fields of science. I'm a classically trained microbiologist, but over the course of five years, I managed to uh, integrate certain components of other fields like organic chemistry, uh, entomology, uh, forest ecology, uh, and, and the likes. So in today's talk, uh, we will see that uh, integration. Uh, and we'll be looking at how uh, this fungus called Boveria bassiana can be utilized as a biocontrol agent uh, in answering um, a five decade old problem in Western Canada, which is an epidemic of the mountain pine beetle. So for today's talk, uh, I'll basically uh, present uh, two sections, uh, one which is on the bacterial genomics projects that it's basically a collaborative effort with several international as well as Philippine local uh, scientists, but that will be a very small component of uh, today's webinar. Uh, the big bulk of the talk will be on uh, my PhD work on the mountain pine beetle, which is essentially divided into three parts. Uh, part one will uh, deal with our culture collection, the maintenance and selection of approximately 200 strains of an entomopathogenic fungus, uh, this Boveria bassiana. And uh, in the process, uh, narrowed down the number of strains to be tested in an actual field evaluation, which is part two. In the process, we tried developing uh, Boveria bassiana mycoinsecticide formulation targeting the beetle. 
Uh, the third part, which is uh, also in progress at the moment, I'll be presenting my data, my current data on the functional genomics. Essentially, we sequence several strains in our culture collection. Uh, we have performed transcriptomics uh, to look into uh, virulence factors involved in the uh, insect pathogenesis, as well as uh, looking exactly on the molecules via targeted uh, metabolomics. I will then summarize the work and provide uh, concluding remarks as well as potential future directions and maybe insights into its applicability uh, under a uh, local Philippine scenario. Uh, so I, as I have mentioned, uh, I was involved in several uh, projects, uh, mainly on genome sequencing of novel uh, bacterial or microorganisms isolates from, I would say, relatively extreme environments, uh, one of which is uh, the isolation of a novel strain of Bacillus thuringiensis from Algeria in Africa, wherein we look at uh, the biosurfactant ability of this strain. And Bacillus thuringiensis uh, is your classical example of Bacillus sensu lato, meaning it is part of the Bacillus series, Bacillus anthracis, uh, cohort and using functional genomics, uh, they were able to pinpoint uh, the actual cry proteins. These are the insecticidal proteins responsible for killing mainly lepidopteran insects. Uh, we're also quite familiar with this uh, for maybe uh, the audience, wherein they have cloned uh, these cry proteins in corn, and hence you have this BP corn that is resistant uh, against several insect pests. Another project that I got involved in uh, is another uh, species of Bacillus, uh, Bacillus velisensis, uh, also isolated from Algeria, uh, but this time from uh, an oil contaminated uh, saltine lake or salt lake. And in, using functional genomics, uh, we managed to pinpoint the biosynthetic gene cluster responsible for this molecule uh, called Fengisin A. It is a uh, basically a lipopeptide, uh, meaning there is a protein component, as you can see in this amino acid residues right here. Uh, you have tyrosine, creamine, uh, glutamine, alanine, as well as a lipid tail, uh, hence called lipopeptide. Take note that this particular molecule, although known already, uh, in our study, we were able to show that it is uh, efficient in killing and preventing division of uh, the escape pathogen. This is the list of uh, bacteria, which includes uh, Enterococcus, uh, Salmonella, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Isinetobacter baumannii, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and other members of the Enterobacteriaceae family. This is of main concern uh, in, uh, in the next few years, especially by 2050, as predicted uh, by the WHO or the World Health Organization. Uh, in this big problem of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we have uh, other projects as well. Uh, this one is uh, from a Brazilian collaborator, uh, mainly looking at this thermophilic isolate, Bacillus lecaniformis, for the purposes of producing uh, thermostable enzymes with applications in um, laundry. Uh, sorry about that. And more locally, I guess, uh, and this is in collaboration with uh, Doctor, uh, with Professor Oliveros Cristel from UP Los Baños in IBS, uh, wherein we look at the genomics of an isolate from Mayon volcano, and it ended up ended up being a novel isolate of Streptomyces, which hopefully we can name Streptomyces mayonensis. Uh, functionally, we were able to show that it has a potent antimicrobial activity as well as uh, anti-colorectal uh, cancer cell line uh, promise. Having said that, I will move on to the second part of the talk, which is on this uh, tripartite interaction, uh, the so-called mountain pine beetle epidemic. It's considered an epidemic because it's somehow limited to one continent. It's affecting not just Canada, but also uh, the northern parts, northern western part of the United States, all the way down to Mexico. Uh, as you can see, there are three players in this uh, interaction. You have here the pine tree, which is the host, uh, of the mountain pine beetle. And there is an antagonistic uh, interaction with that, coupled with 
a third player known as uh, the blue stain fungus. So this blue stain fungus, it is just uh, a general term for several different species or even gen genera of, uh, of a fungus that affects the pine tree and is symbiotically as shown in this green arrow with the beetle. So in tandem, both of this will actually cause the death of the tree. For my PhD work for the last uh, 50 years, there's no mechanism by which we can control this seemingly uh, problematic interaction. Hence, I will try to perturb this tripartite interaction by utilizing a fourth player, another fungus, an entomopathogen called Bovaria lasiana. So how do we see this from uh, a large scale uh, lenses? So the mountain pine beetle epidemic as shown in this map of Canada, you can see that uh, there are two species of pine trees involved in the interaction. Uh, you have the lodgepole pine, also known as Phoenus uh, contorta, which is an endemic tree species present in British Columbia right here on the far west. Uh, currently, it has affected roughly 50% of harvestable mature lodgepole pine. And in terms of land area, it already occupied roughly 80% of the entire British Columbia uh, province. If we then compare that with, let's say, our country, uh, you can actually fit in uh, three of our countries inside this uh, province alone, uh, include, including all the waters that we have. So that is a fairly significant uh, land mass. And if you look at the carbon footprints or uh, sink available, that is, uh, fairly large. What's uh, the status right now is that although this beetle, as you can see in this image, it's a fairly small beetle. It's a bark beetle. It dwells underneath the bark of the tree. Uh, it's roughly five to seven millimeters in length. It's somehow is restricted only to the lodgepole pine, but over the last 20 years or so, it started seeping in and managed to cross a species barrier. This piece barrier uh, is the jack pine having a totally different, uh, I guess, immune mechanism to evade this insect pest. What's striking is that if you look at this interface right here, this is the so-called Canadian Rockies, those areas where there's actually converging plates and there's a lot of mountainous, large polar cap uh, mountains it started to actually infect those uh, trees right there. And using genomics uh, also uh, done by our university, but not my group, they were able to show that this is actually a hybrid zone, meaning uh, the lodgepole pine as well as the jack pine actually managed to create an offspring, which then was hypothesized to have uh, an opportunity, a window for the beetle to actually gradually build resistance towards the uh, defense mechanisms of the jack pine tree. So at this point, it is fairly alarming, mainly because the species of pine tree that is found in Alberta, this neighboring province, is the same species of tree that is found not just in the western side of Canada, but all the way to the east coast here in Nova Scotia, uh, areas of the Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick. So this is like where um, Titanic actually sank somewhere here. There's a lot of uh, survivors actually managed to, to swim all the way to uh, Nova Scotia. But having said that, this is not just, uh, I, I guess, a provincial problem. It, it's actually, there's a significant continental threat that is uh, uh, associated with this uh, epidemic, and we will see that later, especially when we factored in uh, climate change as well as shift in uh, host uh, uh, species. So biologically, uh, again, looking at the tripart tripartite uh, interaction, you have here the pine tree that is negatively affected by the fungus, a blue stain fungus, and the mountain pine beetle. And if we look into the life cycle, we can start first, I guess, with uh, the adult uh, female beetle, which is uh, actually quite available only for two to two, three days outside the pine tree. 
So this uh, beetle will then land on uh, a suitable host, a, a new naive uh, pine tree, and start laying their eggs in the process. But for them to be successful to colonize, the tree defense mechanism, uh, mainly composed of monoterpenes, uh, those pine tree nice smells that, that, that we actually associated with Christmas, um, will produce this so-called resin popcorn. So this is like a hardened resin excreted by uh, the tree while the primary beetle, female beetle, will start boring into the inside of the tree. So the tree continu continuously produces this resin in the hope that uh, the monoterpenes will actually kill the beetle. Uh, there's a chance that the primary or uh, this, uh, the very first female beetle will die, but it has a mechanism uh, through the course of evolution to actually um, make that monoterpene converted to another molecule, a molecule called uh, transverbinol. So the pinene molecule uh, will be converted to a transverbinol. And in, in the mountain pine beetle biology, transverbinol is actually a sex pheromone. It will start attracting several other female and male beetles in the process, and hence a concerted mass attack will happen on that particular point where the resin is being produced. If successful, they were able, uh, the female will start tunneling and making uh, galleries um, underneath the bark. So this is just subsurface of the tree uh, and start laying their eggs. The eggs will then develop into a larvae and start creating perpendicular gallery or tunnels. And this procedure is uh, quite important, especially uh, winter will be coming soon. So as the time progress, take note that this beetle galleries uh, will keep them protected uh, in the harsh winter of Canada. So sometimes uh, we will have temperature as low as minus 45 degrees Celsius. So that's the point that you don't want to go to the lab and work at all, or you don't go home at all for a week uh, until, of course, temperature is permissible to uh, to your health. So going back, uh, once these beetle galleries undergo hibernation, uh, the following year, sometime in the uh, spring summer period, uh, it will help that metabolic uh, uh, pause and pupation will happen. Uh, the adults will then emerge and then complete the cycle for another round of infection. Kindly of take note that uh, as the tree gets uh, depleted with nutrients because these beetles are feeding on the phloem uh, materials, a secondary infection caused by this blue stain fungus will then gradually go into the interior of the tree, uh, especially targeting the, the sapwood and the hardwood of the tree, uh, rendering the tree unable to actually transport water because the fungus will plug the actual xylem and tracheid elements of the pine trees. Take note that this pine tree also will not immediately turn brown. This will turn brown or uh, a sign of death after two to three years only when the beetle already undergone at least two rounds of uh, reproductive generation cycles. And we'll see why that is important in the subsequent slides. Ecologically, uh, this interaction has huge implications. As you can see, in terms of distribution of this host tree, it's not limited to uh, Western Canada. It's present all the way to the East Coast, also of the United States, all the way down to Mexico. And if we factor in the current uh, climate change susceptibility model, at least for the province of Alberta right here, looking at how the current uh, infection rate is happening, especially in Southern Alberta, it is somehow predicted that global warming will then allow for an invasion in the next eight years in the neighboring province of Saskatchewan. If you look at this uh, uh, graph right here, without uh, warming, you'll see that there is a relatively uh, lower sort of colonization area by 2030. So that's roughly eight years from now. But if uh, global warming continuously uh, affect this uh, 
interaction, then that can double up to 2 million hectares. And hence, if you look at how this may affect not just um, the forestry industry, but uh, the carbon credit, that's a lot of sink that will be liberated, contributing further into global warming. So how exactly are we trying to at least uh, control this problem, this epidemic? The strategy is fairly similar with the current COVID-19 pandemic that we're uh, experiencing. It's to slow down the spread. Um, in Alberta, there are two major ways by which this is uh, done. Either you find that single tree in the forest, several hundred kilometers or hectares away, or you harvest the entire lot and burn them down. So I, in either method, you're actually killing the tree and essentially uh, sacrificing them. This translates to half a million dollar annual loss um, in the Albertan economy. And if we factored in uh, welfare costs as well as environmental costs, that can easily be uh, translated to 90 billion Canadian dollars. Having said that, of course, there are natural abiotic as well as biotic mechanisms by which uh, this beetle can be controlled. One can easily perform selection of uh, excellent lines or varieties of pine trees, uh, or even perform genetic breeding for that matter. One can increase the natural predators of this beetle, one of which is, well, so far, the main one is a woodpecker. So they feed and they basically, uh, using their, their hard beaks, uh, probing into uh, the underneath of those uh, infected trees. Or you can also do a, a, some sort of a beetle competition. If you can somehow increase other beetle populations, such as the ambrosia beetles, then that can maybe contribute to uh, lowering down the population uh, of this uh, mountain pine beetle. The more natural one, although fairly uh, difficult to control, but you cannot, it's incontrollable actually, is we're hoping for an extended cold winter. Um, that is not being attained for the last 20 years, maybe a factor of global warming, of course, and hence there is sort of a latitudinal shift uh, of this host insects and hence targeting other uh, areas in uh, higher latitudes, even in the Arctic uh, regions of Canada. And with such, uh, we look into something more uh, that we can control, employing an entomopathogenic fungus, uh, Bovaria bassiana, and look into its potential applicability towards this uh, uh, problem. Okay, so you will see uh, in the subsequent slide what this uh, organism is. But uh, fundamentally, uh, this is an entomopathogenic fungus. It has this um, uh, biphasic type of uh, life cycle. It has the asexual and the sexual stages. Uh, what you're seeing right now will be the sexual stages of this fungus. Uh, if you look at the evolutionary tree by which uh, they are somehow uh, limited to the order Hypocrealis, this group of insect or arachnid uh, killing uh, fungus. And for today's talk, we'll be looking mainly on members of the Fordisiki Taceae, uh, where uh, Bovaria bassiana is included. As you can see, there are several uh, misnamed uh, species uh, within this sensu lato grouping. Uh, it's fairly mosaic, and that is something that can be, uh, of course, um, answered with the present day uh, genomics approaches. So, what you will see in the subsequent slides will be this white muscardine fungus. So it's a fluffy, cottony uh, mycelial mat. And later on, you will see how that can actually kill uh, the beetle. You can see here the elytra or the hardened wings of the beetle, as well as uh, the scanning electron micrograph on how it actually entered uh, the cuticle or the skin of the beetle. That brings me to the first part of my talk, which is uh, the selection process. First and foremost, establishing the culture collection in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Alberta. So here, uh, it took me a few 
years actually to collect roughly 200 Bavaria Bassiana strains across the continent, uh, across the planet. This includes the American, South American, European, African, Asian uh, collection. And this is just a, a summary table that I, I often visit. Uh, and here, it's quite important to actually uh, have a solid, robust uh, tracking method, especially for different strains of this fungus, as well as the host that they were initially isolated, uh, what sort of uh, family the insect uh, belongs to, et cetera. This is quite important when you perform phenotypic characterization of your isolates. As you can see here, um, we have several isolates that uh, we prioritize mainly because of the purposes of um, availability of permits within Canada. And what we have seen with our classical culturing method is that we can categorize them into three uh, sort of colored phenotypes, one of which is the red pigmented phenotype uh, that we uh, designated, as, designated as group one. We have the so-called colorless or non-pigmented strain, uh, group two, as well as the yellow pigmented uh, strain, group three. So this is something that uh, I seldom see in the literature because the fungus has been described as a white muscarbine fungus. The metabolites or the exometabolites that they produce has, has very little attention, at least when I started this project. So that is something that I think is significant, especially when we're establishing the level of virulence of this particular entomopathogen. So with that in mind, uh, we are going to start looking and dissecting if there is a correlation uh, that we can maybe help aid in really phenotyping those 200 uh, uh, strings we have in our collection. So here, uh, we then subject our um, strings in different media and identify key virulence factors, including uh, how fast they grow, uh, in a period of seven days and how much conidia they can produce. And what we have seen thus far is that the group, uh, the red group uh, is the fastest growing strain followed by group two and group three. But in terms of conidial uh, potential, group two will actually outcompete uh, the red and the yellow strains. And we will see why is that important, especially in the context of the industry, uh, massive production and fermentation uh, aspects. Uh, also, uh, in this sense, we choose a million spores uh, as our infection titer per beetle uh, for our subsequent uh, in vivo assays. As I've said earlier, uh, eight months in the year, uh, these beetles are not relatively available because they're hibernating, they're on a metabolic pause during the winter times. So as a grad student, you don't wanna wait that long. <laughs> So we then embark on maybe utilizing a dummy or a substitute or alternative method by which we can establish those virulence factors. And what we have done is to collect carcasses of uh, two insects, that of uh, honeybees, uh, the European honeybees, Apis mellifera, and that of Dendroctonus ponderosiae. Uh, we created insect powders subject that to elemental analysis. And based on the elemental analysis data, we then created a 2% artificial insect medium. And from here, we then look whether there is a potential segregation. We can then differentiate which of the two medium is preferred by the entomopathogenic fungus. And of course, um, hopefully uh, carve down the, the workload for those 200 strains. As you can see in this slide, and you will see in the subsequent one, that's not how we envision uh, the results are. In fact, the, the beetle is not really supporting much of the growth of the fungus in terms of radial expansion. But the, if you see the colonies found in the honeybee, they're actually way bigger. And that's statistically supported. So if you look at um, the different strains we have here, regardless of whether that's the red class, the colorless ones, or the yellow, uh, you, we still have a larger colony diameter for the European honeybees than the actual mountain pine beetle. 
although no selection was uh, established in differentiating the virulence, uh, this is something that I think is still important. The literature often encounters the uh, repeated uh, subculturing of the fungus, okay, especially coming from, let's say, a four degree fridge, actually reduces the virulence level of, uh, of, of, the, of, of certain strains. So that is uh, not good for long-term production. And hence, maybe utilizing an agar where there are insect uh, nutrients associated with it, then perhaps the virul virulence level will not decrease. That remains to be uh, tested and analyzed. So come spring, we now have trees. We now have uh, the ability to go into the forest. So this is the part where I started learning how to become a forester uh, in collaboration with the Renewable Resources Department. Uh, we managed to cut 50 pine trees uh, in Alberta and have that section into this uh, bolt or a short uh, two meter, one to two meter uh, length of pine trees. It smells so good, by the way. It's, it, it smells like Christmas all the time. Uh, and started rearing our own beetles in the lab. And doing so, uh, we managed to test the lethal time associated upon uh, application of the comedia. So this is our very first in vivo, uh, in vitro trial, wherein we expose every single beetle, as you can see in this uh, petri dish, with a million spores. And what you can see here is that uh, seemingly there is a day difference in the killing time relative to the control. As you can see, this is the control on the far right uh, of your screen. You manage to decrease the survival time of the beetle under uh, the petri dish condition. Also, uh, that is quite relevant for group three as well. And lastly, we have group two, uh, maybe a day or two in terms of uh, the lethal time 50 or killing 50% of the population or lethal time 100. So this is quite uh, interesting. Uh, there seemed to be a little bit of correlation in terms of the effectiveness of the pigmentation uh, towards the virulence against the mountain pine beetle. Uh, to answer that question, we then move on to a larger scale infection trial. Uh, so what you're seeing right now is a, a prototypical canonical uh, Kaplan-Meier survivor curve, wherein we utilize a thousand beetles this time around and have that uh, exposed to the conidia of the, the fungus. The far sort of uh, right hand most curve right here, which is the solid line, uh, pertains to the uninundated or untreated uh, negative control. And what you will see here is that as time progress in day six and eight, there is a shift towards the left of the survival of the beetle, meaning they are being killed faster in the presence of the comedia of the fungus. And that uh, sort of interaction is actually quite precipitous. So there is a precipitous decline or drop in the population, uh, reaching 50 or even 25% uh, survival after four to six days. And after 10 days, you can clearly see that the beetle is completely uh, covered, or at least for some of them, with the white muscardine uh, phenotype of this fungus. Uh, in terms of hierarchy, uh, we can see that based on this larger statistically uh, supported trial, that there is, uh, again, the red class one being the most vir virulent, followed by class three. And unfortunately, if you look at the curve here that is somehow overlapping with the negative control, this dotted lines right there, it's actually fairly similar to the control, uh, which then suggests that mm, something's happening with the colorless uh, group of fungus. And to answer that question, we then uh, proceed with titering an actual gradient of conidia. So what you are seeing right now is the same sort of uh, analysis wherein we're establishing the lethal time in the 
y-axis, but we have here an increasing concentration of the spores. These are the, the log function of the colony farming units. This is the concentration that's been tested previously. And as you increase the number of conidia on a per beetle basis, all the way to a billion spores, you can see that it will now reside in the three to four day window, uh, very similar and reminiscent of the red pigmented as well as the yellow pigmented strain. So with that in mind, um, it's quite strategic uh, to know what sort of concentration will actually be effective in killing the beetle for this particular class, the white class of Bovaria bassiana. This is quite important, especially from the aspects of uh, industrial level fermentation, because in uh, the current uh, agricultural setting, especially uh, in greenhouse scenario, there are products that are available uh, that utilize only the white, uh, uh, white strains of Bavaria bassiana because they produce a lot of conidia. You don't really need to have massive kilograms or even tons of substrates. And we will see that and we experience that as well in our own lab. So having said that, we then uh, use a 10 to the 8, uh, 100 million spores uh, to perform our uh, lethal time analyses. Also in parallel, we look at whether uh, the vitality of the beetle might be affected uh, by the virulence of the different classes. And what we have seen thus far is that there's no statistically a uh, significant effect towards whether the beetle emerge early, so that's class A, if they emerge from the bulb one to five days or, uh, or late, uh, 20 to 25 days uh, after the first emergence. Another factor that we painstakingly look into is whether there is an effect towards the gender or the sex of the beetle that we're testing. Uh, to do this, it's either uh, you dissect uh, the ventral turga. This is the abdomen, abdominal region of the insect. And you will see that there is a concave or convex uh, region in, in the anal section of the male or female. Or alternatively, and this is what I typically do because the first one is quite invasive, is you hold the beetle, uh, not to crush them, but uh, I guess, uh, secured enough that it's not going to fall off and listen it inside your ear. So imagine oh, the, the paranoia that you'll drop a beetle in your ear. And we're talking here of roughly 600 to 1,000 beetles per assay. And what we have seen thus far is that there's no difference, actually, in terms of the lethal time, suggesting that the, that the fungus is actually affecting uh, or killing uh, the beetle regardless of, uh, of sex. So this somehow cuts down a lot of the tedious work that uh, I was doing in the lab. And therefore, now that we have established its effectivity, its safety needs to be established as well. Uh, we then tested uh, the concentration that is effective in killing the beetle on live honeybees. So this time around, I learned how to fabricate uh, plexiglasses of honeybee cages. These are cages that are approved by the Apiary Board of Alberta. Um, and I have uh, utilized uh, worker bees uh, and subject them, of course, to uh, ad libitum feeding with sucrose solution and expose them uh, by passage, uh, passive walking on a 10 to the 8 spores per cage. And what we have seen thus far is that there's no significant uh, difference with the mortality uh, of the three representative classes, the red, uh, the non-pigmented, and the yellow, compared to the control. And in fact, um, honeybees are utilized as a vector uh, in a lot of the um, field canola, canola fields in Canada, especially in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, they're utilizing honeybees to carry the conidia of Bavaria bassiana to actually transport them into the flowers of this canola and infect another pest, the trips. So in that sense, 
maybe the concentration that we're going to utilize will not kill pollinators like the honeybees, considering that Bovera bassiana is a generalist entomopathogen. It can basically infect not just uh, the beetle, but any insect for that matter, including arachnids. So with that in mind, uh, we have some robust data to show the effectivity. We then move on to developing our own microinsecticide formulations and do field trials, accounting for both in natura and in, uh, in plant life conditions so that we can actually establish its uh, um, effectivity in the field, wherein there's a lot of biotic, uh, abiotic factors that may limit its effectivity. So we then uh, perform viability testing of our uh, commercial product, a uh, bioseries. Of course, this is your classical serial dilution to establish uh, the actual uh, titer. And this is in collaboration with uh, grad student uh, Heinrich Fernandez, as well as Guncha Isham Nilieva. And what we have seen is that it's fairly stable, actually. So the product, uh, after um, a span of two months under refrigeration condition, the titer actually did not significantly, significantly drop, one of which actually got in the fridge for an entire year. That is when the pandemic started and we did not see a significant drop from its uh, viable count. What's noticeable here though is that the commercial product uh, shown in the topmost line right here is actually far more superior than our in-house strains, which is roughly a thousand fold lower than that of the commercial one. And this is where the white sort of class is important, the non-pigmented ones, because it's easier to reach a titer that is commercially uh, viable. Of course, that did not deter us to maybe hope and we can produce our own 10 to the 10 or 10 billion spores per gram. And hence we employed a large biphasic fermentation approach utilizing classical broth as well as parboiled rice. So here's where we started massively stricking almost 200 petri dishes, have that under liquid culture fermentation setup, uh, started our own sort of Amazon procured growth chambers as well as turkey roasting pans and harvest those conidia to perform the actual quality assurance. And after nine months of painstakingly harvesting and making the spores, we managed to actually create two products, uh, which is part of the red pigmented cohort or class. And based on our titering yield calculation, you can see here that the parboiled rice shown in gray is actually far superior compared to the agar one. So with that in mind, we're now secure that we can actually move into hectares of forest uh, to actually do the uh, formulation trial. To do that, we basically utilize first a greenhouse preliminary testing. And what we have seen is that Although the conidial preparation is stable under refrigeration condition, there is a slight decrease uh, in a function of, I guess, eight weeks right here uh, in terms of our own uh, formulation. And that's a little bit concerning, especially if we expose this conidia in an actual uh, natural environment. So we then uh, look into hiring an acreage farm, a forest stand, uh, also within the city or slightly outside the city and started testing our conidial preparation. And what we have seen thus far in a pseudo forest environment is that there is a, a, at least a one logarithmic decline in the viability. So having said that, in a span of three weeks, we can see that our preparation may not be able to survive and this is most likely because of one, uh, ultraviolet light, and two, humidity. So the conidia, in the presence of minute amount of water, will start germinating. And once they're out of their conidial state, they will be susceptible to desiccation. And having that in mind, we still proceed with an implanta uh, testing in the forest. 
So in the process, uh, we perform a classical Cox postulate of post-mortem analysis, wherein we need to verify from every single beetle that we tested, whether it's ranging from 900 to 1,000, that the death is actually due to the establishment of the Bovaria bassiana infection and not from other secondary fungal uh, infection, as you can see in this uh, lower panel, wherein it could be an aspergillus type, a penicillium, or uh, some sort of a zygomycota uh, uh, infection. Ideally, if you follow the Cox postulate, you will be able to re-isolate the infective agent. Uh, in this case, we were able to do so. And in our greenhouse experiments, we uh, have seen that um, with two different concentrations, we were able to recapitulate the mean lethal time shown in gray bars in a concentration dependent manner, as well as the mycosis being approximately 100% as shown in this white bars for the high uh, comedial concentration or treatments. So with that, uh, we then collaborated with an actual company, a forest company, uh, and applied our products in a forest uh, stand. Uh, so in, in this sense, we somehow uh, did not completely utilize a natural setting, but instead we have this uh, mesh wires or tent to actually entrap the, the beetles. And we, we utilize uh, the microinsecticide provided by our industry collaborator. So we don't have the capability under academic lab condition to massively produce the conidia and establish certain aspects such as conidial yield, stability, and ease of application being the criteria so that it can proceed in an actual forest environment. We then tested two infection models. Model one, wherein the beetle is actually exiting from a pole that's already been applied with the microinsecticide. So in this so-called infection treatment, the idea is that the beetle will come out of the bolt, it will pick up passively the conidia, and then will go into a healthy bolt. The second type of infection model is essentially having a protective treatment wherein you have a beetle that will emerge from an infected tree but it will enter a naive, uninfected health tree that's been applied with uh, the mycoinsecticide. And the analysis process is fairly similar to how we somehow look into COVID pandemic. We are essentially banking on measuring the reproductive knot or reproductive success. And there are several sort of indicators on how this can be measured. First is whether there is an extensive parental larval gallery, so those tunnels that the, the primary female beetle will create, or is there a development of a pupal chamber, meaning the eggs hatch and undergone metamorphosis all the way to the pupal stage, and lastly, whether those galleries were averted or attenuated. And what we have seen, at least for these two models, is very, very promising. Okay? Ideally, the R0 should be less than 1. And if you look at these two graphs right here, the, regardless of um, the treatment, there is a significant uh, decline in the mean gallery length. So this is the tunnel that the, the beetles are creating so that they can lay eggs. So the control essentially is roughly 40 millimeters, while those treated with a low concentration of the microinsecticide, regardless of whether that's model one or two, will actually decrease significantly and even to a point where uh, there's roughly uh, five millimeters uh, similar to the, to the length of the actual beetle itself. Uh, if you look into the larval density, which is another measure of reproductive success, you can see as well that there is a significant, uh, again, decline. The larvae actually did not even develop. So it seems that the fungus can kill the maternal uh, beetle even without uh, really laying eggs. And if ever there is an actual larva that's 
uh, that develop in the process. Although this value is roughly around three to five, they're fully mycosed or myceliated. So they are infected with the fungus. So in that sense, the R0 is actually zero in this case. So this is the very first account that this happened. Um, I have roughly five minutes left here, but I'll quickly brush through uh, in the omics part. So th there's very limited uh, genomics data present in the literature in terms of this uh, fungus. So I have mentioned about the tripartite interaction and perturbing that. Uh, one aspect that we recently looked into is whether we can also uh, antagonize the symbiotic fungus, the blue stain fungus. Unfortunately, what is known in the literature is that uh, Bovaria bassiana cannot outcompete for the resources of other blue stain fungus in other uh, bark beetle system, like in the case of the spruce beetle and the blue stain fungus Letrographium abiatinum. But in the case of our study, what we have seen is quite promising. So using a reciprocal um, sort of interaction, uh, utilizing different carbon nitrogen sources, we have seen a significant zone of inhibition against uh, our uh, Bavaria bassiana, whether it's the red or the yellow, but in terms of the white one, there seemed to be, you know, not, not uh, an actual zone of inhibition. Uh, having said that, if you look at the curve, you can see that the black lines represent the growth of the fungus and the white sort of dotted lines represent the size of the zone of inhibition. So there's really something going on here that we wanted to pursue further, but to do that, we don't know what molecule is available. And hence, we started looking at functional genomics and embark on an actual sequencing of this fungal collection. We then choose representative members of our collection uh, based on these colored phenotypes. And what we have seen thus far is there is a call to rename uh, Bovaria bassiana, at least the red pigmented ones. So looking at this phylogenetic tree right here, you can see that there are two large clades, okay, which is part of the pseudo bassiana sensulato. And the actual uh, Bovaria bassiana, uh, that is, of course, the type stream uh, deposited in the culture collection. Uh, so this is something that uh, we are finalizing. And this is well supported by uh, the closest uh, relative or rather species, uh, Bovaria bromniartii, as well as Cordyceps militaris. The power of comparative genomics is also quite critical when we look at certain metabolites or the actual metabolome of the fungus. So this is one of the known classical polyketide uh, molecule uh, in fungal system. And what you're seeing right now is that there is this highly conserved osporin biosynthetic gene cluster. Osporin is the actual pigment responsible for this red phenotype that you are observing. And that's quite interesting because if you look at, let's say the class two or the yellow pigmented ones, the non-pigmented ones, they also do have this genetic capability, at least from their genome. But what's quite striking is that the last three sort of uh, strains here representing the non-pigmented, non-red ones actually have regions of insertion or deletion. So that is, at least from the genetic blueprint, an indicator that, uh, that indeed that, that there is a separation of the observed colored phenotypes. To answer that further, we then look into transcriptomics and perform sequencing of their RNA and look into the pathways involved at least for us for introduction. What we have seen thus far is that there is a significant upregulation of the key players for the production of this osporin pigment, not just at the level of the main polyketide machinery, but also members of the uh, post-translational uh, modifying enzymes. So it can range from 95 times to as much as uh, almost 400-fold increase at the transcript level. So with that in mind, 
uh, we have sort of a picture here that may differentiate why this red pigmented virulent strains are actually effective in killing the beetle. Uh, that is further corroborated again by another omics technology, uh, looking at the targeted metabolome. And in the process, we again undergo uh, metabolite um, extraction. And in, to make this long story short, using LCMS, HPLC, and mass spectrometry analysis, we were able to detect the actual molecule that is unique to the red pigmented class. So by the way, this is actually an effort in collaboration with Feinberg Fernandez, as well as Daniel Engelhardt from our, our team. Having said that, it's not just osporin that is found in the genome of Ovaria bassiana. Fungal uh, genomes are essentially a treasure trove. It's a gold mine of molecules that are known and those that are yet to be discovered, uh, some of which are found here. You have uh, the red pigment osporin, you have the yellow pigment, tanilin. Uh, there are also other molecules such as um, this bovaricin or uh, the orange pigment by caverin. So the availability of these genomes uh, will then give us uh, an opportunity to probe not just known, but also those that are novel. Uh, I mentioned about the availability and potential uh, specificity and this is essentially uh, my last slide here. And this is an, uh, a work in progress wherein uh, our teams in uh, UBC managed to look and identify the key enzymes responsible for the production of the sex pheromone. One enzyme is found in the pine tree known as pinene cyclase that will basically uh, close this uh, uh, 10 carbon uh, aliphatic molecule geranial diphosphate into an alpha pinene. So this is the molecule responsible for the pine smell, that Christmassy smell that we, we like. And upon hydroxylation, it will then be converted by an enzyme unique only to the beetle uh, to the uh, minus trans verbenol. We're in the process of cloning these genes uh, using uh, uh, either a plasmid or a CRISPR-Cas activation approach. When this materialize, the idea is that if one can decode the enzymes responsible for the sex pheromone of this beetle, that can be applied also, the same technology can be applied for elucidating the sex pheromone of let's say a mosquito or the insect pest of coconut or any further vegetable for that matter, because sex pheromones are fairly unique and therefore it will be targeted and um, it will create a cascade of effect, basically having a fatal attraction in the, in the process. So uh, with that, I'll summarize my, my presentation. I'm a little bit over here, uh, but the part one, in part one, I've shown you how we uh, created an actual culture collection uh, of Bulgaria bassiana for testing, uh, not just for, I guess, the mountain pine beetle, but in any subsequent uh, for insect forest pest. Uh, we have looked and established lethal times. Um, that four to five days is quite critical because of the instability of the comedia. So that should hopefully coincide with, when the beet, with the time when the beetle is actually emerging from the tree. Uh, we have seen that uh, there are three phenotypic classes that corroborated well with the genotype or the DNA sequences. And, uh, establish a safety conidial titer, at least for beneficial insects like honeybees. Uh, this is the first account of a, field of a successful field evaluation of this microinsecticide, uh, accounting for both in planta and in natural conditions. And I've mentioned also how the field of omics, genomics, transcriptomics, and metabolomics can shed light into the mechanisms by which uh, these entomopathogens uh, elic uh, elicit their effectivity in killing their uh, target host. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my group members at the University of Alberta. Uh, my supervisor is uh, this uh, professor here, Dr. John Bedras, and um, the members of the team. The work is essentially um, an amalgamation of efforts 
uh, from several universities and uh, collaborators, uh, as well as the industry partners. Uh, I'm quite thankful for um, the provisions of uh, grants and support uh, from the Vanier uh, all the way to the Alberta Innovates uh, Scholarships and Killam Laureate's uh, Office. And with that, I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions from the audience. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Sir Albert. Let me just change my, my view. Hey. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And uh, sir, congratulations on the successes of your research uh, into the development of this um, myco-insecticide against the destructive mountain pine beetle. And for the members of our audience, again, please drop your questions uh, into the uh, chat box. Please state your affiliation if you have one. And uh, Sir Albert is ready for your questions. Uh, okay, there's uh, some already put here in the chat box, but uh, let me try my, I've, I've managed to write some questions for, for myself. <laughs> and let me ask this, um, Sir Albert, um, how was your experience in uh, getting all of your, uh, you know, the strains of your Bavaria Bastiana from the various collections in the globe? What are your significant um, uh, learnings and challenges, you know, to collect all of these 200 uh, strains and getting them there at the uh, University of Alberta? Yes, um, thank you for that question, Sir Cruz. I would say that it's actually very, very challenging um, for one, as a microbiologist, uh, you need to realize that this is not your prototypical bacteria that usually sits on an acre plate. Uh, challenges such as conidia sort of flying around. Uh, in Alberta, during the winter times, it's very staticky and dry. Mm -hmm. So the chance of conidia just flying around is extremely high. Uh, second, we're talking here of strains. These are not, you know, uh, aspergillus or uh, penicillium, where in visually or even microscopi microscopically, you can actually differentiate them. All 200 Bavaria Bassiana strains look the same, at, at least superficially, unless you do an actual genetic uh, sort of manipulation. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, even before starting, I, I need to ensure that a protocol will be followed to ensure that one, there's no cross-contamination. And if there is, what would be a solution to actually uh, um, troubleshoot it, essentially the, the problem. So um, one, the actual handling takes a long period of time. You need to ensure that uh, I, I utilize three disinfection procedures. Uh, when I'm handling cultures from one screen to another, uh, that, that will be UV light, uh, bleach, and alcohol. Uh, there is actual segregation of uh, petri dishes and plates uh, in different incubators. Uh, a backup of a backup of a backup <laughs> of a backup is required. Uh, culture maintenance is a huge undertaking, let alone having a student handle that, it, it's hard. Uh, so I, I have, you know, a minus 70 backup, uh, a four degree backup, a backup in another building, a backup in another province, so that in the event that, which is somehow sometimes inevitable, a cross-contamination happen, then the first line is to go back to your culture. Mm -hmm. To, to those same cultures. If your culture by any chance is so important that it got contaminated and there's no backup anymore, then I actually utilize flow cytometry. So flow cytometry is this hydraulic mechanism that basically separate every single conidia on a per particle level. Mm -hmm. And one would hope that you separate the contaminant from your uh, fungus of concern. I've never done that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. And may I ask, um, uh, did you have strains from the Philippines as part of your collections? 
Uh, no, actually, uh, I, I didn't have, uh, I didn't tap on the Philippine culture collection uh, mm -hmm. or some difficulties in securing MTAs and MOUs and the likes. Yeah, that's uh, the usual. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a question from uh, Mam Goss. Uh, Dr. Milagrosa Martinez Cos is a professor emeritus here at UPLB, and she's asking if uh, is this this problem, maybe this mountain pine beetle she's referring to that, uh, may be found in our local Philippine tree in cold places, maybe in um, does this uh, mountain Being pine badges. beetle uh, do they happen or do they occur in let's say Baguio or um, I, right off the bat I. I... Uh, hi, Mamila. Um, the, the beetle, the mountain pine beetle, is actually uh, an endemic species in Western Canada. So uh, having said that, there is roughly 300 species of Dendroctonus, uh, and this speciation is geographically limited. Uh, for example, uh, there is a, a beetle, the red turpentine beetle, found in, in China, which is also decimating their, their forest. Uh, but I guess in the context of a, a, a tropical rainforest, there's enough diversity in our forests that uh, th this kind of situation where there's massive epidemic uh, is quite unlikely. And I, I'm not sure if there is a bark beetle, a specific bark beetle, which is underneath the bark of the tree that mm -hmm. is relevant here in the Philippines. A lot of the beetles that I guess I have seen thus far are, are the soil boring one, the, the coconut beetles, or even the, the scale insects that affect this coco lisa yeah. uh, scars scare some sometime a few years back. Uh, but this same technology in principle can be applied to that, maybe utilizing uh, local Philippine Bovera Basiana isolates. A uh, question from uh, Sir Eldrin Argueles. Um, the question is, aside from honeybees, were you able to check the safety of your product against um, other beneficial insects like butterflies, moths, ants, and uh, the like? Uh, not for those particular uh, lists that you mentioned, uh, Sir Eldrin, um, but during the very early stages where the beetles are not available, I usually go into like pet shops and I will simply buy grasshoppers and some mealybugs, uh, some, some trips, and they, including spiders actually, uh, are susceptible to this uh, Bavaria bassiana. Uh, and the key there is really to use that generalist type of infection model, be specific. And that's why we're looking at the possibility of really cloning the sex pheromone of the beetle so that in principle, it, it will not attract the butterflies, the moths, and the ants. Um, this sort of research endeavor is somehow limited to a forest sort of scenario, not really an agricultural or a, a horticultural garden type environment. Uh, but I would tend to think that being a generalist entomopathogen, it can definitely infect and kill. The, the key there is that this Bavaria bassiana is that has very effective chitinases. Chitinases are enzymes that cleaves the chitin, which is essentially an insect's uh, exoskeletal, uh, uh, the molecule found in the exoskeleton of this insects. Thank you. A uh, question from Melissa Montecalvo. And uh, the question is, could you please advise, uh, could, could you give an advice on how to maintain the virulence of uh, entomop entomopathogenic fungi? Um, yes, um, that's one thing that we tried actually uh, looking into. Um, I mentioned about utilizing an actual uh, medium or media developed using the insect host the original insect host that the fungus was um, isolated from. Uh, in our experience, 
we tried maintaining the fungus in an actual insect host. Uh, but that is really laborious and difficult and somehow dependent on the capability of the research units. So th that's one. Second, you need to ensure a good culture collection. So a culture that's never been open and therefore the overall genetic uh, profile will not change, at least of your very original isolate. Uh, take note that this fungus having those teleomorphic and anamorphic stages, uh, they're, they're subject to what we're calling heterokaryotic stage, wherein in a single cell, my um, hyphae, there are two nuclei that never fused. Okay, so there, there's no karyogamy or fusion of the nuclei. And therefore, once they split into two, there's a chance that you only got one half of the original genetic virulence capability. So if you maintain your culture collection well, then you always have that backup to, to go back to. Tatanong ko rin sa ano yun eh, probably. Um, sir, do you think that there may be a better chance of success in uh, maintaining your entomopathogenic fungi and their virulence by, um, you know, rearing them in live, you know, live uh, individuals rather than um, rearing them? I, I, I believe you were saying you were rearing them in, in plates uh, with uh, like insect-based agar? Yes. Um, yes, okay. So in terms of cost, maybe, cost and uh, other indicators, w given everything, do you think there's also a good chance of having a uh, you know, successful, uh, you know, maintaining the virulence of your, uh, of your fungi there using live rather than your plates? Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Uh, the, the live uh, insect rearing procedure uh, definitely give or turn on um, silent gene clusters for insect virulence uh, in a fungus and hence maintain uh, their level of virulence. But then again, uh, there's a question as to what is the diversity of that insect host? Of course, there's always diversity uh, within the insect host itself. Um, in local scenario, I, I can think of maybe utilizing uh, those insect meal flowers, mm -hmm. like those powdered insect that, of, of course, the, the key here is uh, we wanted to establish a fundamental basic uh, mechanisms. So if we start utilizing an, uh, a host that is not acinic, meaning there, there are other microorganisms, the insect microbiome as a factor, then there's a potential competition, not just with your Boveria bassiana, mm -hmm. but we're not sure now if you will propagate that same sort of fungus in a massive level in, in an insect medium that is not sterile. So the, the, there's a trade-off, of course, uh, and it melts down to what exactly your objective in, in, in doing so. We have a question here from Ethan uh, Jacob Roska. Um, he's asking, you know, if, uh, if you are testing this product safety, uh, have you tested it on, on vertebrates? Would you say it is safe for, I don't know, for a human being if he or she accidentally uh, yes. consumes it? That is a very relevant question. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen right here. So in the context of uh, the virulence factors, uh, one key uh, molecule called bovaricin, this uh, deficipeptide, uh, which is just a, you know, a molecule that's made of uh, you know, phenylalanine, uh, valine, and isoleucine, um, isovaleric acid. This is a cancer-causing compound. So this is a no-no for any insect pest mycoinsecticide registration, at least here in, uh, in Canada. And that's why it's critical 
at least when we were performing our comparative genomics, that the products that we are testing in the field doesn't have this particular gene cluster. Uh, this molecule, tenolin, is the yellow pigmented uh, molecule, uh, at least imparting the yellow pigment in the, in the class three. It's been found to elicit uh, apoptosis in horse blood erythrocytes. It, I don't know if it's been tested uh, in human uh, models, but if you look at this repertoire of fungal metabolites, nivalinol, uh, fumarose, uh, rosinone, th these are molecules that are potentially relevant under human uh, health and safety. So of course, we need to establish uh, the safety of this product, uh, especially in the context of uh, long-term effect. Uh, but the good thing about entomopathogens pathogens though are they, they don't really last long in the field. Mm -hmm. So once the insect is killed, and after two to three days of rain, chances are they're, they're gone. So from the perspective of a company that produces this, oh, that's good. It means that the farmers will continuously buy this. But in the context of uh, prolonged uh, and sustained presence out in the environment, that's quite low. Ang danger lang siguro dyan is yung, you know, the exposure of people during the actual production of the, uh, the yes. insecticide itself. So that's, yun ang hindi pa natin siguro malalaman right now. Uh, that, that is something actually, uh, at, at least for the wettable type of mm -hmm. microinsecticide, they have that mixed with water to one, activate the actual conidia so that they will grow immediately. And second, the actual person applying it they're using a full PPE, mm -hmm. uh, an actual P100 uh, sort of respirator, wherein you don't even smell uh, carbon monoxide. <laughs> that's, that's considering that the comedia is fairly small. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Kumir uh, pa magtatanong, please drop your questions in the trap. In the chat box, we'll be accepting uh, one or two more questions before we wrap things up. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting, kung meron pang hahabol. Sir uh, Albert, if you were to apply the approaches that you have uh, done you know, in Canada while you were doing your research, uh, so on top of your head, while you're here now, nandito ka na sa Pilipinas, what organisms uh, ano, here, Philippine, Philippine organisms, uh, are interesting to you and what possible environmental problems uh, could they possibly I know, solve you know, uh, for your future research uh, endeavors? Um, okay, I, I'm not sure how to answer this, mm -hmm. uh, but then I envision uh, to leverage on the biodiversity, the complex biodiversity that we have in our country especially a lot of our resources are untapped or unexplored True. from the marine all the way to the mountains we have a lot of endemic plants uh, animals unique environments from hot springs to to volcanoes that those are hot spots of potential speciation uh, and those are, I think, what we can probe. It's key to maintain them in culture collections for and become, uh, you know, available to the scientific community. Um, the utilization of an interdisciplinary lens or lenses, for that matter, whether that's from a single individual or, more importantly, I guess, collaborative environment, will, will really dissect this from a different angle. 
th this kind of questions. Uh, I, I may not be I'm having difficulty really describing this because I'm I'm currently employed at the Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. Uh, we have a final call for proposals, mm -hmm. uh, a deadline tomorrow, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and hence, uh, to leverage on the expertise of our local scientists, as well as the biodiversity that we have in our country, unique enough that most likely we, 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 we are the only ones who will have these resources, is something for our audience to really consider as part of their research portfolio and future research and divorce. Thank you very much. Very well said, uh, Sir Albert. And of course, to sa ating mga audience, no? I know to sa ating audience, kaya ay marami mga college students uh, and uh, young professionals. Uh, please take uh, yung advice to Sir uh, Albert. You know, there are a lot of things, lot of things to do, uh, especially, you you know, um, and top resources and top environments that you could uh, do your research and study on. And um, we hope that, you know, you are, some of you will be able to um, uh, connect with Dr. Rosana for your, uh, if you have questions. So please do, uh, sir, can you, can you give your email address if it's okay with uh, you? Sure, I, mm -hmm. I can. Okay, so for example, Jonathan Digma, and uh, he said that was a very good presentation, and uh, it is an interesting area to work on and collaborate with. Uh, he's just asking if he, you are open for collaboration. Maybe, Sir Jonathan, tagasan po kayo. So for those uh, faculty, and uh, Sir Jonathan is from Cavite State University. I think... Uh, um, so Rasan is working with someone at uh, yes. Katsu? Uh, I'm working with uh, Dr. Fatima Eladon Prasada. Mm -hmm. We're working on honeybee probiotics and how the uh, American fowl brood disorder, which also is decimating honeybees, can mm -hmm. potentially be salvaged using uh, lactic acid bacteria in general. Okay, Lala Palias, Dr. Cruzada. Anyway, so uh, okay, uh, again, please evaluate our webinar. It's um, the link is already posted at the chat box, so please click on it as soon as possible. And um, let me before we let's go to our closing program right now. And with that, uh, again, thank you very much, Sir Albert, no, for um, uh, accepting our invitation for. Uh, talking, serving as our resource person in our uh, Museum Biodiversity Webinar Series. And uh, as token of our appreciation, we are providing this digital certificate. You know, uh, and it reads as a certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Albert Remus Rosana for serving as a resource person during the UPLB Museum of Natural History Biodiversity Seminar on Bavaria, Basiana as biocontrol agent of the invasive mountain pine beetle, then Broctonus ponderosae in Western Canada. Held today, March 30, 2022, 3 o'clock to 4.30 p.m. via Zoom. And it's signed by our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon. Maraming salamat po. Let us all give a big round of virtual applause to Sir Albert Rosana. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Paul, sir. Thank you, everyone. So uh, before I close the, the meeting, if you want to uh, check our website at mnh.uplb.edu.ph, um, you can email us at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We have a lot of uh, social media accounts. We're in Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Just follow the uh, handle UPLB Museum. We're also in um, Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. Uh, do go to our YouTube channel in probably in two days. By that time, baka na-upload ko na yung webinar recording. And uh, again, maraming salamat sa inyo, Sir Albert. And to all our audience, uh, we will be having our uh, next biodiversity webinar on April 12. And it will feature our one of our curators, uh, Dr. Uh, Pastor 
Professor Pastor El Malabrigo, um, our curator for native trees and concurrently the uh, manager of the UPLB of oh, the UP Laguna Land Grants, and he will be talking about native trees. So again, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Don't forget to evaluate our webinar.